Okay, welcome to the last episode for 2021. Very, very exciting. What a year it's been. And I hope all of you guys have uh, had a great year and looking forward to 2022. The question is from 2005, question 16, which is explain the changes on functional residual capacity that take place with administration of anesthesia. And just looking at the examiner's report, this is probably the best summary of an exam's report I have seen. So much so that I actually don't need to summarize this because they've told you exactly what they want. So the points required for a pass were understanding the determinants of FRC, the size and time course of the change with a general anesthesia, explanation of the causes of the change. So that would include posture, muscle tone, and diaphragm shift. And then additional marks were given for changes in the shape of the diaphragm, the exaggerated effects caused by abdominal surgery and pre-existing conditions, loss of nitrogen splinting, chest wall compliance versus lung compliance, differences with local uh, slash regional anesthesia, use of PEEP, intrathoracic blood volume, and also the effects of the FRC change. Now, importantly, and I can understand why candidates would do this, is that many candidates describe the results, consequences of the anesthetic induced change in FRC, which did not attract many additional marks. So in other words, what would happen is that with that question, um, they would talk about the consequences of a reduction in FRC rather than how um, FRC is changed with anesthesia. So certainly you get additional marks with that, but uh, it doesn't answer the whole question. So the challenge for this is that um, we want to go through all these points here and try to tie that back into the question. Now, I, I don't think you need to have everything in here to get a really high score. All right. But we're going to try, going to try. Now, the literature that uh, I've used for this question, uh, so primarily it's chapter 21 in nuns uh, in called anesthesia and also chapter two, elastic forces and volumes, which has a little bit on FRC, but the primary chapter and really this question has really come from chapter 21 in nuns. Uh, I'm also gonna reference Miller's chapter 13 because there are some numbers and some concepts in there, which um, I think can be a little bit contradictory and especially the numbers and how they fit in with the other um, like other some of the percentages that they talk about. And so we'll, we'll go through those and hopefully we'll try to come to like a, a consensus with them. Now you see all these definitions for FRC. And I think that what is probably most common is that um, whenever someone talks about FRC, they'll probably talk about all these four concepts. And I think that the idea is that as you go, as you go along, you want to be able to talk about them very, very succinctly. So this is just a summary of all those four things. So the FRC is the volume of gas at the end of tidal respiration. It equals your residual volume plus your expiratory reserve volume. It's where your lung recalls in equals your chest wall recall out. And the number that you'll see commonly given is it's approximately 30 mils per kilo. So that in a 70 kilogram man, it's 2.1 liters. The important thing to note is that this is in the supine position, all right? In the upright position, it's probably around almost 40 um, to 50 mils per kilo. So just make a note of that. The numbers that you see quoted at 30 mils per kilo is for the supine position. And I'll show you in a couple of tables next. So this is the table from NUNS, so table 2.1 in chapter two. And what you'll see is that in the sitting position, the FRC, so in the sitting or upright position, the FRC is 2.91 liters. 
and then you can see that it drops to 2.1 liters. And this is for um, healthy males. And I think the average height was about 1.7 meters in this study, okay? So you can see that in the supine position, it's 2.1 liters, which fits in to your 30 mils per kilo that um, the number is often given. And you can see how it changes. So with the supine, with the arms up, it increases slightly. Um, and then in the prone and lateral positions, you'll see that, uh, yeah, it, it does decrease from the upright position, but um, a little bit more than it, it has a little bit, sorry, the FRC is more than what it is in the supine position. So that's quite interesting. Um, the other thing that's interesting is also the percentage of rib cage breathing. And the reason I point this out is there will be some articles which talk about rib cage breathing and probably relevant for epidural anesthesia and and the contribution of rib cage breathing to normal tidal ventilation. So in, in the upright position, rib cage breathing accounts for cent, almost 70%. And then in these positions, it accounts for one third. Okay, so in other words, that um, the other way that it um, contributes is through the diaphragm. So the, the other primary way that um, tidal volume is generated in the supine positions is through the diaphragm. Okay. Now, this is from Miller's, and this is actually for anesthesia. So I think what, what happens here is that uh, they are saying that the FRC goes from 3.5 to 2.5 from the upright to supine position. And then after that, there's another further loss of 20% um, or 500 mils, so that the end result is two liters. Now, what are the determinants of FRC? So there's a formula that you'll see in nuns. You don't need to memorize this, but I think it's quite nice in that it includes uh, a lot of the core things that are gonna be affecting FRC. So your, your body size or your height. So there's a linear relationship to height, age. So as you increase in age, there is an increase in FRC. And again, here is where the numbers don't exactly sort of match up. So on in the text, you'll see that um, it says that FRC increases approximately 16 mils per year. But from the formula, it looks like it increases um, approximately 19, mil, 19 mils per year. All right. So again, not, not, um, not important, but the, you know, these things are are a little bit contradictory, not contradictory, but conflicting, not consistent. That would be the word to use, okay? And then after that, uh, um, BMI is also um, gonna be affecting your FRC as well. So the, so the key things are body size, age, and obesity, and gender. So females have 10% less uh, FRC than males. And the big ones are gonna be posture. So upright has more FRC in the, than the supine position. And then um, other things such as pregnancy, disease states, and also anesthesia as well. And it's really this one here that we want to talk about today. So how does anesthesia affect FRC? Look, the primary one is going to be through the change in posture. So you go from the upright sitting position to the supine position. And that leads to a loss of approximately a liter. Okay, so from nuns, it goes from 2.9 to 2.1. And then from millers, it goes from 3.5 to 2.5. And quite rightly, these reductions will be magnified with the following conditions. So things like obesity, um, pregnancy in the Trendelenburg position, and also pneumo, any sort of pneumoperitoneum. Uh, for laparoscopic surgeries in any abdominal, intra-abdominal surgeries, okay? Now, general anesthesia re will reduce FRC by 15 to 20%. So that's the number you'll see in nuns. In millers, you'll see a very consistent number at 20%. This is the time course, which the examiner wants you to talk about. So the time course is that there is an immediate reduction in FRC on, in, on induction, and it reaches its final value within minutes, and it stays constant throughout. 
And then the recovery to baseline actually takes a couple of hours after the end of anesthesia. So just to go through that again, in your head, um, the FRC starts dropping immediately on induction. And then after that, it reaches its final value within minutes and stays constant throughout. And then the recovery back to baseline after the anesthesia has ended takes a couple of hours. Now, what causes the reduction in FRC? So it's related to the loss of respiratory muscle tone. And that leads to changes in the chest, in the chest wall shape, okay? So there's a decrease in the cross-sectional area of the rib cage, and that accounts for approximately 200 mils reduction in your FRC, or approximately 10%. Now, a key thing of this is that it is not worsened by paralysis. And this has been stated in, in both nuns and Miller's. I understand that uh, Brandis has muscle paralysis as one of the key five reasons why FRC reduces or changes. Just note that um, I think that the latest evidence is that paralysis does not change this at all. All right. Now to strengthen sort of the respiratory muscle tone hypothesis is that um, they've shown that ketamine anesthesia, which preserves muscle tone, actually preserves your FRC. And that reference uh, is in Miller's. So the use of uh, ketamine anesthesia will have different results to FRC compared to using uh, other intravenous or inhalational agents. Now, these are debatable changes. They're quite contentious and they only have a minor contribution, but um, given that the examiner has put those, these concepts down in, in their answers, it, it's probably worth um, adding, adding these things in, okay? So when they talk about diaphragm position, uh, the, the de dependent or lower part of the lung displaces um, cephalad, and that would cause a reduction in FRC. And the non-dependent lung um, does not change and may even move quarterly. So what that does is that can actually increase your FRC. So the, the reason why the reason why it displaces uh, cath lab is due to the increase in abdominal pressure. Okay. And then same with the non-dependent side, because you don't have that abdominal pressure pushing, pushing against it, that's why it moves down and actually can um, increase your FRC. Now the diaphragm shape. So um, the description in nuns is that there, instead of a change in position, it's actually a change in shape. And it, it only makes a small contribution of uh, less than 30 mils, all right? And that reference is in nuns. So what nuns describes in this chapter is that the diaphragm position is a little bit controversial. And as you can see that, um, you know, there, there's one side that's moving uh, cephalic and there's one side that's moving quarterly. And, and so what, Nuns is sort of referring to is that instead of actually the diaphragm position changing, it's actually the diaphragm shape. But Miller's, I think, describes it uh, quite uh, well in terms of saying, look, it, it is quite contentious with these descriptions. And really, at the end of the day, they're only sort of minor contributions. All right. The, the big one is going to be your respiratory muscle tone. Now, thoracic blood volume uh, is another one. And the idea is that the shift of blood from the peripheral circulation to the chest, which causes a reduction in your FRC. So in other words, that, um, and, and look, this has come about because we're going to talk about what happens with during epidural anesthesia. And that's why this concept is, I think, um, brought, brought up here. All right. Because with epidural anesthesia, there, there's actually a reduction in your thoracic blood volume. And that's one of the contributions to why FRC actually increases with epidural anesthesia. Now, this is with regional anesthesia where you have a block up to um, T1. And 
what it's shown is that your FRC actually increases by approximately 300 mils. So just note that with regional anesthesia, your FRC increases. I know that um, some model answers have epidural anesthesia decreasing FRC, but the evidence is that it actually increases FRC. And, and the reason for that, again, is that the diaphragm, okay, displaces quarterly. So the diaphragm moves down and therefore increases your FRC. And then the other concept is that there is also a reduction in your thoracic blood volume. So these are the, these are the two things that are related to um, epidural anesthesia, which causes the increase in FRC. And that's uh, described quite well in nuns. Now, Millis has tried to describe it, but I don't think they've done a good job. So I've just highlighted the section in Miller's under regional anesthesia. And what they've said is with extensive blocks that include all the thoracic and lumbar segments, inspiratory capacity is reduced by 20% and your expiratory reserve volume approaches zero. Now, the problem with this statement is that we know that FRC equals your residual volume plus your expiratory reserve volume. And if they are saying that your expiratory reserve volume approaches to zero, then they are suggesting that your FRC will also decrease with regional anesthesia. And they've given you, and they've given us two uh, references, 152 to 153. So I've actually gone and looked at those articles. And this is article 152. So this is by David human chest wall function during epidural anesthesia in anesthesiology in 1996. And these were the major findings of this study. Rib cage expansion contributes to tidal volume during high epidural anesthesia in most participants, even when most of the muscles of the rib cage are paralyzed. So that's quite interesting. I mean, it, it sort of, um, goes against sort of what we would naturally think is that with a high block, you know, you have paralysis of your intercostal muscles and loss of your rib cage expansion. But this study actually shows that rib cage expansion still plays quite a significant role in terms of uh, generating your tidal volume. So the second part of their findings was that the mean phasic electrical activity of intact respiratory muscles, such as the scalenes, does not significantly increase in response to rib cage muscle paralysis produced by epidural anesthesia. And I think that one is suggesting that, uh, you know, the other hypothesis is that if you do have an increase in your rib, or so if you do have maintenance or some sort of rib cage expansion, What's causing it? Is it caused by your accessory muscles, such as your scalings, which are not um, paralyzed? But this one shows that uh, it's still being maintained. And now thirdly, the high epidural anesthesia increases the FRC. An increase produced in most participants caused by a cordate motion of the diaphragm and a decrease in intrathoracic blood volume. So I think we can all agree that uh, this article here confirms that there is an increase in FRC and it's due to a downward motion of your diaphragm as well as a decrease in intrathoracic blood volume. But there's no sort of mention about your expiratory reserve volume. And this was the second article in Miller's, so changes in ventilatory pattern and arterial oxygenation saturations during spinal anesthesia in a man. And look, again, nothing on expiratory reserve volume, but this one, again, talks about your rib cage contribution to the tidal volume and that uh, it was maintained during spinal anesthesia. In fact, this one here actually showed that the rib cage contribution increased significantly from before, so 20%, um, to during spinal anesthesia, which is uh, 30%.
So that's quite interesting. So this again is in the supine position. So remember that um, in the supine position, your diaphragm contributes quite a bit to tidal volume, but during spinal anesthesia, you can see that um, your rib cage actually increases. But again, nothing on expiratory reserve volume. So, so I'm not too sure about this line here, an expiratory reserve volume approaches zero. I think that um, I think that reading the articles, this may be talking about some other aspects of the experiment, but not but not expiratory reserve volume. Okay. Now, what are the consequences of uh, a reduction in FRC? So this is something that I think that all you guys should know well. And the way that I summarize it is that there is an increase in work of breathing, and that's due to a reduction in compliance and an increase in airways resistance, okay? There's a reduction in oxygen store, there's an increase in your pulmonary vascular resistance, and there's also an increase in atelectasis as closing capacity, oh, sorry, as your FRC approaches closing capacity. Now, this table from NANS is quite interesting. So what it shows is that your total respiratory uh, lung, sorry, your total respiratory system compliance is reduced during anesthesia to a figure approximately towards the lower end of normal. Now you can you can see these figures here. So lung is 150, chest wall is 200. And I think that most of you would have sort of realized by now that you know, the 150 and 200, these are the numbers that are often quoted as normal compliance for a, for a normal lung. And in this table here, it's actually suggesting that these are the numbers that occur during anesthesia. All right. And then these are the ranges of the normal values they've had. So they've got for, for the lung, 90 to 400 for the chest wall, 100 to 350. So a big range here. But the, the thing to note is that with um, anesthesia, yes, it reduces it, but it reduces it towards the normal, um, towards the lower end of what's considered normal, okay? This is the um, sort of corresponding concept in Miller's that static compliance of the total respiratory system, so lung and chest wall, is reduced on average from 95 to 60 mils per centimeter of water during anesthesia. Again, like a little bit different from nuns. Okay, and I can see why, you see why this is so frustrating for, um, for trainees when they've, got, when they've got two core textbooks, nuns and Miller's, not sort of being consistent in, in terms of these really, really important values. So you've got, um, you've got, yeah, Miller saying 95 to 60, and you've got um, none saying a range of, you know, 50 to 190 going to 80. This graph is quite interesting. So this, this, this graph actually shows that the major changes um, during anesthesia are in the lung rather than the chest wall. And what they have here, so this is your normal compliance curve, is that with anesthesia, there is actually not just a shifting, not, so you don't actually just go down, but there's actually a shifting of the compliance curve down, all right? And then what they've done is they've done both lung and chest wall. So you've got your normal lung compliance here. This is uh, awake. And then after that, you've got your anesthetized, both um, anesthetized and paralyzed over here. Okay. And you can see that um, there is a reduction here. And then you look at the, um, the chest wall. So this is chest wall. And again, with, with anesthetics, it's pretty much the same. So I think what, what this article here is showing is that the majority of the reduction in your compliance, in your total um, respiratory lung, in your total respiratory compliance is due to your lung. 
rather than your chest wall. And, and the reason why it's due to your lung is due to the reduction in FRC. Now, finally, with um, atelectasis during anesthesia, so the incidence is approximately 75 to 90%. Miller's has uh, 90%. And Nunn's has quoted that there's about 10% of lung tissue affected. And Miller's is about 15 to 20%. And then there's an upwards of 50% where the lung tissues can be collapsed in cardiothoracic surgery. Now, the causes of atelectasis during anesthesia, so there's three causes. There's airway closure, where your FRC um, reaches your closing capacity. There's compression atelectasis, which is the transfer of abdominal pressure to dependent areas of the lung. And then the third one is absorption atelectasis. And look, absorption atelectasis doesn't really cause atelectasis. It, it just quickens atelectasis. So in other words, what happens is that if you have an alveoli that is compressed, either through um, airway closure when your FRC reaches closing capacity or due to compression. What happens is that absorption atelectasis will absorb the oxygen here and quicken the, um, and quicken the collapse of the alveoli. In other words, that in, if you had nitrogen in here, then obviously nitrogen is not taken up. And so that, is what's called nitrogen splinting. In other words, it keeps it keeps those um, small airways open. Now, the way to prevent this is that uh, there's we can, we can they talk about the use of PEEP. So, the quoted figures that they use is seven to nine centimeters of water uh, water in healthy lungs undergoing non abdominal surgery, and also that when you think about FI. FiO2 to avoid using unnecessarily high FiO2s. And some of the figures that you'll see is um, when you use uh, FiO2s of 0.8, it actually allows that bit of nitrogen to prevent absorption atelectasis. And I think you, you'll see that sometimes when, um, you know, have, have a look at in theater with your consultant when they do the extubation of patients, a lot of consultants now will, will run an FR2 of 0.8 rather than an FR2 of 1. And that's that's the reason why. Okay. So look, this would be how I would structure my answer. I'd have the definition and I would have the determinants relevant to anesthesia. So these would be um, a discussion of posture, a discussion of the of um, what happens with general anesthetic with specific um, sort of specific explanations on what happens with the respiratory muscle tone and as well as the time course. And then after that, um, I want to talk about regional anesthesia and introduce the idea of the displacement of the diaphragm and thoracic blood volume. And I could even, I could even add this into the general anesthetic and just have a little um, blurb about it, it having sort of minor importance uh, in the overall scheme of things, okay? And then finally, I want to talk about the effects of decreased FRC, um, specifically lung versus chest wall compliance. So that would be in my work of breathing, where, I've, where I'm going to talk about the, de the reduction in compliance due to the lung, um, due to a reduction in lung compliance, and that chest wall compliance is pretty much unchanged. And then finally, how we can prevent atelectasis, so the use of PEEP and the maintenance of nitrogen splinting. And this, I think, would cover pretty much everything that the examiner wanted. So I'll just have a quick look at what the examiner wanted. Understanding terms of FRC, size and time course, yep, change with general anesthesia, explanation of the cause of the change, so posture, muscle tone, diaphragm shift, yep, changes in the shape of the diaphragm. Um, exaggerated effects caused by abdominal surgery and pre-existing conditions. So I think we can add that in when we talk about posture, uh, loss of nitrogen splinting. Yes, we're going to talk about that. Chest wall versus lung compliance, differences with regional anesthesia, PEEP, intrathoracic blood volume, and the effects of FRC change. Great. All right. 
Okay, got my pen and my red pen and my ruler over here. Okay, guys, last exam paper you're going to do with me for 2021. Okay, you ready? And let's go. So we'll have our definition here. And then we're going to have changes. Anesthesia, and we'll put general, and a big one, changes with anesthesia regional, and then the last page should be consequences of decrease FRC with general anesthetic. FRC is the volume gas at the end of tidal respiration, where FRC equals your residual volume plus your expected reserve volume. Also, where FRC is where lung we go in equals chest wall we call out normal equals 30 mils per kilogram in the supine awake position okay so changes are due to primarily posture so there is approximately a decrease of one liters when patient goes from upright to supine position and reduction is magnified with pregnancy, obesity, obesity. Nimble peritoneum, and Dallenberg. Two, so there's loss of respiratory muscle tone during GA, where there's a decrease in FRC by 15 to 20%. This occurs immediately on induction, reaching its final value within minutes where it stays constant at the end of anesthesia recovery to normal baseline takes several hours now, there is no difference patient paralyzed ketamine anesthesia preserves muscle tone and therefore FRC and I'll just quickly write possible role with Kefalad displacement of 
diaphragm in pendant lung changes in diaphragm shape and or increase in thoracic blood volume. Now changes with regional anesthesia um, Anesthesia, there is an increase in FRC approximately 300 mils to two. Displacement of diaphragm and also a decrease in the thoracic blood. Consequences of FRC with GA. One, two, three, four. Increase in work of breathing. Decrease in oxygen store. Increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. And increase. Atelectasis. So there is a decrease in lung compliance with minimal change in chest wall compliance. There's also an increase in ways resistance and with atelectasis prevented with peak seven to nine centimeters of water in healthy lungs and also avoidance of high Eight to preserve and splinting. And I think with this, we can draw the compliance curve. Oh, this is from zero to total lung compliance because we're talking about um, lung compliance static. Yeah. All right. And I think I am pretty happy with that. So that's nine minutes.